And one of the things that um, God has directed me to and God has directed for myself and then directed for us is are we being affected? Are we being affected? Uh, affected by, when I say that, is, is affected by our life in Jesus. Is it affecting our daily life? Is it changing the way we think? Changing the way that we uh, see things and how we interact with people? Are we being affected? Because ultimately we have to change. There has to be a change in our life. When, when Jesus comes into our life, it, it is a continual change. It should be continual change. That change, that process is called sanctification. It is, a, it is a process that starts at salvation and it's a continual change till the day we meet Jesus in eternity. But it is something that should always be happening. We should always be moving forward, should always be changing, should always be uh, de de desiring more of God. That is something that God would want us to do. So the sermon title this morning is, Are You Being Affected? So go with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15. Starting with verse 1. And we're going to go down to verse... Well, actually, 19 verses. So we're going to read 19 verses, the first 19 verses of 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Ready? Now, brothers, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you have received and in which you stand. Through it you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve, then he was seen by over 500 brothers at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present time, though some have passed away. Then he, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born in the, at the wrong time. For I am the least of the apostles, and I am not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with, with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we, so we preach, and so you believed." And, and, and so you. Now, if Christ is preached that He rose from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. If Christ has not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. Yes, and we, we would then be found false witnesses of God because we have testified that God raised up Christ from whom he, did not, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead did not rise. For if the dead did not rise, then Christ was not, has not been raised. If Christ is not, he is not raised, your faith is in vain and you are still in your sins. Then they also who, gave, who, who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now, what was going on here was there was people saying that the, the resurrection was a hoax. They had taken the body, they had switched it, they moved it to make it look like Christ had risen. Paul had to go and he had to remind them that all of this happened, verse 3, according to the Scriptures, verse 4, according to the Scriptures. Those are very important things. It was according to the Scriptures. It wasn't something that was made up. It wasn't something that was a hoax. 
It happened according to the Scripture. Now some might say, well, you know, people know the, know the old, knew the Old Testament and they knew what, it was gonna, what they were going to say, so they planned it out that way. But this was so perfectly done, so perfectly on spot with the Scriptures that they couldn't have planned it. They couldn't have done it. It was God fulfilling it according to the Scriptures. Now how do we know? What's he say? He, he, he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. Seen by Peter. Cephas is Peter. And then by the twelve. And then by over 500 brothers at once who are still alive, most of them. So there's proof. There's physical eyewitness proof that Jesus was alive. He's basically saying, go and talk with them if you have doubt. Go ask questions. Eyewitness testimony is one of the best ways that things get ironed out or get, get proven. Eyewitness testimony. He's saying, go, go prove it for yourself. Go talk to people who have seen Jesus for themselves, heard the teaching. Maybe Jesus even touched them. But eyewitness testimony... He says, uh, then he was seen by James and some of the apostles. And then he was seen by Paul. Seen by Paul. So, there is proof. There was proof. And we see in these books, the, the, the book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Paul uses and talks about himself as the least of the apostles, one who doesn't deserve to be an apostle because he persecuted the church. Paul sees himself, or views himself, as what he'd done in the past. And how, how, how often do we do that? I cannot be used by God because of this. This happened. I did this. I said this. This is what I used to do. How can God use me? Paul views himself as that. Is, that, is. is that a wrong thing? Is Paul doing is Paul being discouraging to himself? I think I think not. I think Paul, because he says, but by the grace of God I am what I am, that Paul is recognizing where he came from, where he was, but by the grace of God, God saw fit to change his life and make him an apostle. So we have to view ourselves in that way. Yeah, we might get discouraged and say, well, God can't use me because of this, because of that, because of something that I did or something that I said or something that I, uh, how I reacted or whatever. But by the grace of God, God saw fit to change your life and make you a witness for Him. So we have to view it like that. See, like I said a few weeks ago, God sees us at our best, we view ourselves at our worst. Because we're human. That's what humans do. Now, he basically goes on to say that if Jesus was not really resurrected, then there was no point in doing what he's doing. In verse 12 and following down to 19. There's no point in doing what I'm doing if Jesus was not really raised from the dead. There's no reason for it. You're still dead in your sin. You're still, you're, you're, you're still uh, sinners. You're not going to heaven. It's all a hoax, so we don't have to do anything if Jesus really was not raised from the dead. But we know He was raised from the dead, right? We know that. All the promises that we have in the Scripture, all the promises we have in the Word, were cemented in, concreted in, however you want to say it, because of the resurrection. They were made real and made perfect because of the resurrection. If Jesus would have just died and still buried in the tomb, there would be no reason for us to sit here today and have this sermon here. There would be no reason. Because there would be no, no, no reason to change. There would be no reason to continue seeking God as we talked about last week. There would be no reason, no, no reason to pursue after God if Jesus never really rose again. But He did. He did. Now, Paul brings us back to remembrance of those things, of, this, of the things happening according to the Scripture. 
these Christians were no longer having a real effect on their society. They were having no real effect on their society. As a matter of fact, they were being affected. They began to start to believe what was being said. It was having so much an effect. And, and this happened throughout the, Paul's letters. Galatians. The Galatians we know. If you've studied Galatians, you know they walked away from God. Started believing what the Judaizers were saying. The Corinthians were beginning to believe that the were actually having effect on them that the resurrection really was a hoax. They were no longer turning their society upside down. Their society was turning them the wrong way. Their worldview had been changed. Their worldview had been changed. And that, that brings us to 2017. Is your world affecting you? Or are you affecting your world? We really have to think about that. No matter how old we are, are we being affected? Or are we affecting? We all rub shoulders with people. We all do. But we have to really feel and really understand where Jesus is. That's why it's so important to get inside the Word and read the Word and spend time with God and, and, and take notes on what God says to you and, and really spend that time with God because what's going to happen is you're going to be start being affected by the things around you and you're going to stop affecting those around you for Jesus. Time with God is so important. Time in the Word is so important. That's what was happening here. Paul had started the Corinthian church. They knew what they were supposed to be doing. They knew. But they began to believe what made sense. Because listen, this kind of stuff, Jesus raising from the dead, all of the things according to the Scriptures, if you didn't have the faith to believe and you weren't a born-again believer, it's... It, we, we, we see this all the time in science. They say, well, these kinds, kinds of things aren't really real. We were watching a, a, a thing last night. It was a new movie that's coming out called Genesis, Paradise Lost. It's a trailer they've got out, and it talks about how, how Genesis can be proven through science if, you're, if, you, if you look at it from a creation perspective. But if you look at it from an evolution perspective, you then begin to disbelieve the creation story. So the same thing happens with us. If, we, if it doesn't make sense to us, we begin to default back to what makes sense, which is things that are, that are not of God. And that's why this was making sense. It was a hoax. Because after all, I mean... This church was started after Jesus died. They didn't see Jesus resurrected. They didn't see Jesus doing miracles. They only know what they heard and what they felt spiritually and what, what God had done. But it began to make more sense than it was a hoax. They were, uh, they were being affected by their surroundings and not affecting their surroundings. And so we need to really hone in and be in God and with God and just press in Him to be affected by Him and not affected by our society and be affecting our society, those around us, those that live within our house, those that live, that we work with, that we talk to, that we spend time with, families, friends, workmates, whatever. We need to be affecting them for Jesus and not allowing our society to affect us for the opposite reason. Let's go to uh, Isaiah 53. We're going to look at what, what Paul is talking about here. Paul brings them back to the Scriptures. We're going to be starting in verse 4. Surely He has borne grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and his stripes. By his stripes we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. But the Lord 
has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He's bringing him back to these scriptures. Who was Jesus? This was proven in the Old Testament. This was shown in the Old Testament. The prophecy of Jesus dying on the cross. He was bringing them back to that. Psalm 22, verse 16 and through 18, he says, For dogs have encompassed me. The assembly of the wicked has enclosed me. Like a lion, they pin my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare on me. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. And he's bringing them back once again to those things that were according to the scriptures. These things happen in the Old Testament. They were prophesied in the Old Testament. So he's bringing them back to those things that were according to the scripture. He rose from the dead according to the scripture. Okay? He was, all those things happened according to the scripture. Paul says in verse 4, he was buried, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Now he, he, he goes here and he's talking about verse 22, that was the crucifixion story in the, the Psalms. And this, this here in Isaiah is another depiction of the crucifixion. So this was according to the scriptures. Go with me now to John chapter 2, 18 through 22. Then the Jews said to him, What sign do you show, do you show us, seeing that you do these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking concerning the, the temple of his body. Therefore, he was, he, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said, what he had said to them. And, that, and, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, this was a fact-based in scripture. Jesus was talking about building the temple tearing down of the temple. The Bible tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was referring to himself as a temple. He tear down this temple and be built up again in three days. Speaking of himself. And it took that realization of seeing that happen become opening their eyes to see what he was saying. Because they were saying, well, it took 46 years to build this temple. You're going to build it in three days? And then when he rose again in third, three days, it clicked. That's what he was talking about. That's what he was talking about. He was proving to them again that he was going to die and rise again according to the Scripture. Jesus was a real person. He was a real person. It's like you and me. He was, he was God, but He was fully man. He was fully God. He was really beaten by real people. This isn't a story. He was a real person who was really beaten by real people. He was really seriously nailed to a wooden cross. He really died. He was in a real tomb for three days. All of this is real. And yes, he really rose from the dead. If you go to Jerusalem and you take the Holy Land tours, they found a place where they believed Jesus was buried. They, they found the tomb. Now if you go look at tombs of other people that, were, that had died and were buried in tombs, there's bones there. But they found where Jesus was buried in the tomb and there's nothing there. Nothing. No bones. No DNA fragments. Nothing. Jesus really, seriously, wholeheartedly rose from the dead. No question. No question. But see, that takes faith to believe that. 
Faith we must have. It takes faith to believe it. We have to believe it. Because if we don't believe it, we're still dead in our sins. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians. We're still dead in our sins. We can play church, we can play Christian, we can play those things, but if we don't really believe it, we're not really saved. We're not really going to heaven. See, that's the parallel. Jesus was a real person who really was beaten by real people who really died and who really rose from the grave. But if we don't believe it, we're really not going to heaven. We're really not. If we don't believe that, if we don't put our life in that, we're not going to heaven. Sorry to say. Jesus spelled it out in John chapter 3. You must be born again. You must be born again. You must put your life and faith in Jesus. You must believe what He says in order to go to heaven. And live your life according to His word and His will in order to go to heaven. If you do not, you're really not going to go. You can't... You can't live your life as a Christian by tradition. You can't live your life as a Christian by, by uh, well, my mom and dad were Christians. My grandma and grandpa were Christians. No. You have to make a decision for yourself. You have to know that Jesus was a real person who really died, who really rose from the grave. Then you'll go to heaven. If you don't believe it, you don't live for it, you're really not going to go to heaven. You're not. You're not going to go. You're going you're to be left here. Or you'll spend an eternity apart from Him. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen for you. Jesus really rose from the grave. And we really have to believe it to really go to heaven. Point blank. You really have to believe it. You really have to live it. You really have to walk in it in order to go to heaven. You can't just play church. You can't play Christian. You can't play this life of Christianity. You have to walk in it. You have to live it. You have to breathe it. You have to spend time with God. You have to know what God wants you to do. You have to know His will in order to go to heaven or you're not going to go. You won't go. You have to. This is where the rubber meets the road, you know. This is where it all meets the road. Where are we in God? Where are we in Jesus? Do we really believe? Do we really know? Do we really know Him as Savior? Do we really believe Him? Today, right now, at 1110, do we really know Him right now? Have we really sold out our life to Him? Because if we haven't, we're not going. We're not going. Listen, the enemy loves to tell us, well, you can live half, halfway. You, can, you know, it's all right. God understands. That's a good thing that you hear from people. God understands if you have this. Yes, God does understand. But we are to then go forward in God and ask for forgiveness and press into Him more, not live our life according to what we feel. If you really don't believe it, if you really don't understand it, and you've not asked God to help you to understand it, and you really don't see it as reality in your life, you're not going to heaven. This is where the Christian life meets the road. This is where it meets the road. We have to really believe Jesus was real. That He was really beaten. He really was crucified, he really was buried, really was risen, he really lived a sinless life, he really was born of a virgin birth. All of those things, we have to believe them. And we have to stand by them, we have to live them out in our life. But we're not going. We're not going. That's point blank. I, you know, if I'm sounding pretty harsh, that's the truth. That's the truth. We have to do that. We have to understand that. Well, we're not going. I want to go. I want to go. Did you know yesterday was... said yesterday was going to be the end of the world. Did you know that? Did you realize that? That's what they said. said. Yeah. Yesterday was going to be... Yeah, yeah, yesterday there was supposed to be some planets aligning and all this stuff and it was going to be the end of the world yesterday. Well, we're still here. 
the rapture hadn't taken place and we're still here. A lot of the prophecies I said was going to happen didn't happen. So God has given us another opportunity to make it right, to get it right, to believe, to fully entrust, fully put our hearts before Him. Because if we're not, we're not going. We're not going if we don't. Paul deals with the Galatians. We're going to look a little bit at the Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, and following down to verse 10. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who has called you to the, into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not a gospel at all, but there are some who trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Although if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than the one we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say now again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than the one you have received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? For if I, for if I were still trying to please men, I would not be the servant of Christ. You see, this is what was happening in Galatia. They were being affected by their territory, by their society. By, by the, they were no longer affecting their society. They were being affected by their society. And they were beginning not to believe. Paul was simply telling them, look, if you don't believe, you're not going. If you don't believe in Jesus in a real way, you're not going. And that's the truth of the gospel. Paul says, if I, if, I would, if I was trying to please men, if I didn't want to try to please God, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. Paul was the example to the, to the, to the Gentiles of a sold-out life to Jesus. And he's an example to us. Sold-out life to Jesus. That's what we're to have. That's what we're to be. Sold out to Him. Because if we're not... We're not going. We're not going. That's just point blank. The word's true. The Bible you're holding in your hands is true. It is true. It's a true word of God. And it's powerful. And it's living. Have you ever had a time when, the Bible, when, you, when you were going through something and the Bible, you, when you read it, it didn't apply to you? God makes it real for you. That's why it's living, and it's true, and it's powerful. If we allow Him to, and if we allow the Bible to, it will speak to us in our situations and circumstances. We need to stay close to God. That's why I'm saying all the time, every week I say, seems like every week anyway, Get into God's Word. Read God's Word. Study God's Word. Write, take notes. Do all those things. Pray on a regular basis. Do all those things. Stay close to God and you will affect your society. And you will go to heaven. Anything less without a repentant heart, you're not going. We're not going. We said this in Sunday school, and this was—I actually put this in my sermon, and that's what brought it to my to my attention this morning. Romans two twenty four. See, I would never want this put in the book of life about me. Paul says to the Romans, as it is written, "The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you." I wouldn't want to stand before God and have that said about me. People do not believe in me because of you. People do not trust in me because of what you've done. Because of you. I don't want that. I don't want that for you and I don't want that for me. That's why it's important for us to understand that Jesus desires a real relationship. A close one. A close one. 
We have to believe the Word. We have to live by the Word. We have to live our life according to the Word. We have to live seeking His will and seeking Him. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, it says in Hebrews. We talked about it last week. Do we seek God? Do we pursue God? If we're not, if we're ho-hum, ho-hum, we're not doing and we're not living the way God would want us to do, and we, and we stop believing, we start being affected by our society and not by the Word of God and affecting our society, we're not going to heaven. We're not going to heaven. So that's my challenge for you. It's my challenge for you. Do those things. Seek God. Trust in God. Walk with God. Talk with God. Allow God to work in your life that you could affect those around you and not to let those around you affect you. So, let's go ahead and do our hymn, Sandy. 326. 326. Very good song for this message this morning.
That is a very fitting hymn for today's message. And we really must trust and obey. We really must. And that goes to trusting that everything that we talked about today was real and true. And the word that you have in your hand is real and true. We must believe that. We must trust that. And if we trust that, we must obey it. We must obey it. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We give you praise and glory for your word. We thank you for the blessing that we've been shown this morning. Help us, Lord, to trust and obey. Help us, Lord, to have a greater relationship with you. We pray that you touch each and every one today. If there's someone here today, anyone here today, that says that this message, what God was saying to you, you have a desire to have a greater relationship with God, I want to see your hand. You want to have a greater relationship with God? Don't be satisfied. Don't be satisfied. God wants a greater relationship with you. So let's, Lord, I just pray you see the hands raised. Lord, and I pray that you, you, you touch all of our hearts that we would desire a greater relationship with you. Not to be satisfied with where we are, but Lord, to, to work toward a more sweeter relationship. And Lord, we thank you for that. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise and glory. There's a song that just popped in my heart. I'm not, not going to sing it, but it says that every, every day, Jesus gets sweeter as the days go by. More and more sweeter as the days go by. Something to that effect. That's where our life should be. That's where our life should be. It should never be one of ho-hum. Ho-hum, whatever. Today, so I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Jesus is here, but whatever. Jesus should be, should be sweeter every day as each day goes by. And we thank Him for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here today. Praise God. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Sorry about that. See, you should never get a, a preacher excited about the Word and then you just forget everything. Thank <laughs> you.